This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Valtoro, the gold hedging platform for the crypto community. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely starting at just one milligram. Go to valtoro.gold slash epicenter to get early access to their V2 platform and to start trading. And by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. So today our guest is Jerry Brito. Jerry Brito is the executive director at Coin Center and previously was at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. So Jerry is has been in the crypto space since I believe 2011, and he's been you know quite vocal as a lawyer and speaking with lawmakers and regulators uh, for quite quite a long time uh, about crypto and sort of blockchain in general, but mostly cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and how U.S. regulations apply to these new cryptocurrencies and asset types. It was a great interview. I mean, I think that guy is so sharp and so on point. Uh, and so we talked about a whole a bunch of things. Um, we talked about the, this paper that he wrote uh, recently called The Case for Digital Cash. Uh, we also talked about Libra and everything that's been going around there and some of the legal implications and regulatory implications with Libra. And Jerry only had an hour with us, so we had to cut it a bit short, but we did talk also about the recent FinCEN guidance um, around uh, digital currencies and whether or not uh, you know exchanges and digital currency issuers uh, are or not money services businesses. So it was a fascinating interview, and we hope people will have Jerry on uh, again in the future to uh, talk more about this kind of stuff. Also, uh, while preparing for the episode, I I read through Jerry's blogs and his paper on the case for electronic cash. Like Jerry has a certain eloquence with words. And I found like so many sentences that I found like, oh, let's copy it into my email. Uh, and I'll read through them, read through these sentences someday. Like, um, and so do check out his, uh, his writings as well. I, I find they're so well written and so beautifully crafted. Yeah, so I'll have a, all the links uh, to everything that uh, we mentioned in the show in the show notes. So we've got a couple of things that uh, we want to mention. So first, uh, you guys are doing a podcast. Chorus is doing a podcast. Tell us a bit more. Yeah, so um, yeah, we've, we've, we've started this podcast. We're calling it the Chorus One Podcast. It's going to be quite different to Epicenter. And our thinking here is like when we founded Chorus One, uh, one of our key objectives was to create a community of engaged token holders that work together to shape the future of decentralized networks. You know, um, so if you think of a network like Cosmos or Solana or any of these networks, it's ultimately a network of people. And it is important that the people that are holding the tokens, that are delegating, that are using using these networks, they became, they are really engaged with it. They're informed about what's going on in the network, informed about the governance that's that's happening there. And so um, we are now involved with three networks in a production capacity and like four networks in a test capacity. And we felt that we have a lot of insight onto how these networks are being shaped by the decisions that the people in these networks are taking. Um, and we felt that podcasts could bring out what's the internal chatter of these networks very well and that we were uniquely suited to bringing out that internal chatter. So that's that's what Chorus Podcast seeks to do. It's to improve the conversation around these networks and improve the decision making in these networks. Uh, it doesn't have a defined format. Some of the Some of the episodes will be interview only, but they'll be shorter than Epicenter. Uh, others might cover other, others might be educational covering certain topics uh, some might have governance debates and things like that we are still playing around with the format and we would love for you to check the check the episodes out and give us feedback on what on the direction you would like that podcast to go 
That sounds great. I haven't listened to it yet. I, I know there's, I think, three episodes out, but uh, I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing it. So I think you can get it pretty much anywhere you get podcasts, right? So like iTunes, and I, I added it to my uh, Pocket Cast. It's on Spotify. Uh, I'm I'm not too sure where where you can get it either. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you can get it like just about anywhere you get podcasts. So yeah, yeah. Subscribe to the to the chorus uh, the chorus one podcast uh, in your in your in your podcast app. Just search for chorus one and and you'll find it. And well, yeah, we'll we'll link to the show notes in the show notes as well. With regards to events, there's a couple of things happening in the next couple of weeks. So first, uh, you guys are you and Brian and Sunny are all going to Korea for the Biddle Asia conference. Yes, I'm kind of I'm kind of regretting that I didn't. Uh, plan to go to this conference now yeah you you're you're missing out on a lot of ramen and bibimbap and kimchi yeah but i get to enjoy paris in the summertime when there's nobody here which is priceless <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh, tell tell our audience about uh, uh about what you'll be doing there so uh so there are two main events um so one is uh, a, a hack atom which is a hackathon organized by the interchain foundation and the second is a conference called Middle Asia 2019. And um, Chorus is a sponsor of the Hack Atom. And Epicenter is a media partner for Middle Asia 2019. We have a session in the Hack Atom as, as Chorus. And we, have, we are featuring on a panel. We have an Epicenter panel at the Middle Asia 2019 conference. So uh, you can grab... You can meet with Sunny, Brian, and myself in both of these events and catch up about Epicenter as well as Chorus. Okay, so the hackathon is, I'm looking here, Friday the 19th to Sunday the 21st of July, and you can get more info at biddle, B-U-I-D-L dot Asia slash hack Adam. I'll link to that in the show notes. And uh, the conference is just biddle dot Asia. And the, the, the panel is happening on the 22nd. So Monday, it's moderated by Brian and it will feature Adrian Brink uh, of Cryptium Labs, Sunny uh, Harriet Cow or Chow of Iris Network and Liang Lu of Scale Labs. So if you're in Asia, in Seoul for, uh, for Biddle Asia, you should definitely attend and uh, check out the Check out the panel and let me know how it went because I will not be there, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully it will be recorded and we'll be able to release it as a as a bonus episode, as an epicenter live episode. Yeah, yeah. we'll try to get that. Uh, we'll try to get that organized. And lastly, and this I will be here at this at this event. Uh, it was mentioned last week. Uh, there is DapCon happening in August, I believe. It is on the twenty first to the twenty third of August in Berlin. And I will be there with Frederica and Sunny, and we'll also, I think, be doing an Epicenter Live um, episode there and probably a meetup in Berlin if there aren't too many events competing with uh, our meetup. So you can get 20% off by going to dapcon.io and entering the code Epicenter Dapcon 2019 that will also be in the show notes. And the last thing I want to mention, I'm not sure if I mentioned it on the show or not. I've been talking about it on Twitter uh, quite a lot, is that I started a Cosmos newsletter uh, about two months ago or so. And I've been trying to keep it regular, like you know, once every two weeks or so. And the newsletter basically just kind of covers everything that's been happening in the Cosmos space over, over that period. So you'll just get a bunch of links to interesting articles, software updates, product updates from all the different wallet apps, validator updates. So it's it's just basically a bird's eye view of everything that's been happening in the ecosystem over the last two weeks or so. And so to sign up for the newsletter, I would love you to sign up. It's at cosmology.email. It's really simple. And um, you can sign up there and uh, get my newsletter in your inbox. So with that, here's the interview with Jerry Brito. Hi, so we're here with Jerry Brito. Jerry is executive director at Coin Center and previously was at the Mercatus Center at uh, George Mason University. And today we're going to be speaking with Jerry about a whole lot of things, including uh, Coin Center, 
a paper that he wrote uh, titled The Case for Electronic Cash. We'll also talk about Libra since it's on everyone's minds. And finally, we'll talk about the recent uh, FinCEN guidance with um, and how it relates to cryptocurrencies, exchanges, wallets, and things like that. So, Jerry, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So to start off, why don't you tell us a bit about uh, your background and how you got involved in the crypto space? Sure. So, um, you know, I'm a lawyer and my whole career has been in technology policy. Um, uh, I was, as you say, before Coin Center, I was at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. And there I directed um, the technology policy program, so focused on uh, all kinds of tech policy issues. So uh, uh, old school telecom issues, but also copyright, privacy, and increasingly uh, towards the end of my time there, emerging technology issues. So sharing economy, drones, 3D printing, and then Bitcoin. Uh, so. Uh, I sort of chanced upon Bitcoin in 2011, um, and when I saw it, I just fell down the rabbit hole as so many people do. Um, and I think what what I saw, uh, just from my vantage point, was all of the regulatory questions that Bitcoin raised. And at the time, nobody was really, um, certainly not in DC, nobody was thinking about these questions. Um, that you had people, sort of the main question people were asking on, on Bitcoin talk, I remember, was how can this be legal because only the federal government has the power to coin money. And you know that's not actually correct. And, and uh, there's, so nobody was really thinking about this. And I was just very lucky to be right place, right time, and start writing about it, and talking about it, and publishing about it. And pretty soon just sort of um, became the person in DC, the folks uh, on Capitol Hill and that the agencies would go to to ask questions about Bitcoin early on. And as, a, as an early uh, sort of lawyer in the space and in D.C. talking with lawmakers and regulators, what were some of the questions that they were asking you at that time? Very early on, um, they just didn't understand it at all. Um, uh, and so it was very much just how does it work? Um, uh, then you started getting the questions of, is it anonymous? Um, that was a, you know, a question that we would get a lot. Um, and then um, it be, you started to have things like Silk Road, um, and so you started to get questions uh, around illicit use. Um, and so early on, um, I was part of a uh, task force that the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children put together with law enforcement, um, folks at different think tanks, um, and folks in the crypto community. And it was uh, uh, good because the, the report that came out from that task force ultimately pointed out that, hey, um, uh, while there are illicit uses, there are a lot of positive uses here, there are ways to deal uh, with the illicit use, et cetera. And eventually that led to uh, the first congressional hearings on uh, cryptocurrency that were, I think, really good for um, uh, for Bitcoin because essentially what law enforcement and, and uh, the, the feds said at that hearing is that they had it under control, that it's fine. Um, so. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of that's kind of what, what the questions were always about early on. And what led you to start Coin Center? It sort of became up. So this was sort of after those hearings. Actually, those hearings were in 2013, uh, in late 2013. Um, and just as the uh, amount of uh, attention and interest from government on Bitcoin was at its peak, um, right after that, you had Mt. Gox collapse. Um, and you had the Silk Road uh, bust. And so uh, you had a lot of attention. A lot of it was negative. And at the same time, um, really at the, the only institution um, that Bitcoin had, the Bitcoin Foundation, was also um, kind of uh, uh, falling away. Um, and so there was no institution um, to really basically answer the basic questions that policymakers needed answers and to develop policy thinking here. Um, and so there was just an obvious gap. And so it was just a, um, a, a confluence of events where different people sort of recognized that gap at the same time. Uh, so Alex Morcos, who I think you've had on the show before, who now is a Bitcoin Core developer, apologies for Nivasan, who at the time was Andreessen Horowitz, uh, myself, uh, our co-founder Robin Wiseman, uh, who uh, runs uh, our lobbying for us. Um, we all kind of saw this and we just um, you know, saw that this needed to happen. If you're holding a significant portion of your net worth in crypto, you're probably waiting for your portfolio to moon at any time. But holding crypto doesn't mean you should be irresponsible in the face of volatility risk. That's where Voltoro comes in. Voltoro is the leading gold hedging solution for the crypto community. 
And as a stable asset trusted for millennia, gold is the perfect long-term hedging solution. And at Epicenter, we've been using Voltoro since 2014 to protect a portion of our company's assets against volatility. Now, you might ask, why not use a stablecoin, Seb? Which is a great point. And don't get me wrong, stablecoins are great and a real benefit for crypto adoption. But algorithmic stablecoins are still a very new and experimental asset type. And some asset-backed stablecoins have been scrutinized for being under-reserved. With Voltoro, your gold is 100% insured and secured in vaults deep in the Swiss mountains protected by Brinks. Every single gram of gold is audited and holdings are made transparently available on their website for anyone to verify. And most importantly, it's quite literally your gold. You can choose to have it delivered to you at any time. To learn more and to get access to Voltoro's brand new V2 platform, which includes an interface overhaul and trading in Dash, Litecoin, Ether, and Silver, go to Volturo.gold slash epicenter. That's V-A-U-L-T-O-R-O dot gold slash epicenter. We'd like to thank Volturo for their support of the podcast. Maybe like just, just an update around Coin Center. So what are some of the key battles that the organization is fighting today from a policy perspective? So it's interesting. Um, uh, we have, uh, I think, been pretty successful on the different policy initiatives um, that we've been focused on for the past four years. Um, so look, big policy issues that I think you probably have talked to Peter about in previous episodes before was securities regulation. And so there, um, after all of the, you know, it, it was, I think for lots of folks, they felt it was a pretty slow process, but actually, um, I think relative to how the SEC usually operates, it was pretty quick. Um, we got some pretty good clarity um, on how um, they view cryptocurrencies as far as securities law. So they have stated clearly that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and things like them are not securities. So for us, that's just a huge victory. Um, there's still some outstanding questions that I think affect a lot of folks. Um, but for us, that, I mean, that was something, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, are these securities or not? That was an open question just a little bit over a year ago. And it's not anymore. So we're very happy with that there. Um, with uh, anti-money laundering uh, and Bank Secrecy Act regulation, um, we, you know, FinCEN came out with guidance in 2013 um, that explained how they applied the Bank Secrecy Act and its regulations to uh, cryptocurrency uh, and the ecosystem, but there were still a lot of open questions about them, and we thought that they were uh, sort of continuing to interpret it right. But as we'll talk about in a minute, um, they issued guidance a couple months ago where they've kind of clarified that the way that we've been interpreting it and suggesting that it be interpreted is the way that they interpret it. So that's a huge victory. Um, and on the money transmission side, um, which has been a, a perennial issue for cryptocurrency, we've worked with the Uniform Law Commission to develop a um, uh, a model act um, for state regulation of cryptocurrency money transmitters. Um, that's now making its way to different states. California, um, uh, cross your fingers, might be adopting it soon, which would be a huge win. Um, and we've also worked with some members of Congress to introduce um, legislation that would preempt state money transmission licensing for non-custodial users. So if you're running um, uh, you know, some service that does not take custody, you wouldn't be subject to money transmission. So we're pretty happy where we've been. And so it's like, well, what battles do we have? Um, uh, it's a pretty good position to be in. The two big battles, um, and I wouldn't call them battles, but the two big challenges I still see, one is tax. Um, the IRS, um, uh, unfortunately, has continued to drag its feet in issuing guidance about cryptocurrency. And so there are a lot of open questions. Um, uh, related to uh, de minimis transactions, related to how do you um, uh, do hard fork accounting, um, lots of different things. So there we've um, worked on a report that uh, highlights what are the open questions. We've um, delivered this um, in briefings to Congress, um, to the Treasury, and to the IRS. Um, uh, and we've worked with members of Congress to introduce a couple of bills that would uh, try to get at some of those problems. Um, so taxes is a live issue for us. And the other is it's not so much a battle that we're fighting. It's just a battle that we think could come um, and we want to be prepared for it. And that has to do with privacy. Um, so uh, to date, cryptocurrencies um, uh, have tended to be very public and transparent. Um, and so that's been a very simple thing to explain. But of course, that's not a good solution for anybody. Uh, you want to have individuals to have privacy. 
uh, in their financial transactions. And that increasingly we're going to see an upgrade to um, uh, the cryptocurrency so that they're private, right? It's kind of like when we went from HTTP to HTTPS, right? And that's a good thing. Um, but we want to make sure that policymakers understand it. So um, this is this paper I think that we'll discuss. Um, we've sort of um, taken a two-step approach. One is my paper where I sort of make the case to policymakers so that they make sure they understand why um, uh, what we call digital cash, which is um, digital currency that is peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, censorship resistant, and private, which is what a dollar bill is, why that's important for a liberal open society, which I think we can all agree we want to have. Um, so that's one paper that I wrote. Uh, in, uh, I think I was published in January or February this year. And then the second paper um, that we published was by Peter. And there he sort of explains um, if you wanted to put regulations to curtail digital cash, um, you would find um, uh, that there are constitutional barriers to doing that. Um, so it's sort of two. One is we're saying, hey, uh, this is a good thing and you shouldn't regulate it. And number two, but if you are trying to regulate it, understand you're going to be limited in, in that. Right. I mean, we've also had uh, Peter Van Valkenburg, also from Coin Center, a number of times on the podcast. And so, you know, we're, we're not going to spend too much time uh, digging into Coin Center because we've we've no, yeah. you know, covered that organization at length. And there's so many things to talk about. But those who are interested in learning more about Coin Center and sort of diving deeper into what that organization does, uh, I would invite you to listen to uh, our two episodes with Peter Van Valkenburg, uh, which are 182 and 227. And feel free to go to coincenter.org where you can yeah, learn a lot course. more. <laughs> <laughs> of course. It's also interesting to me that when I go through the old blogs of Coin Center, 2015 mostly, mm -hmm. many of these blogs are about how law enforcement uses the transparency of Bitcoin. There's a blog, blog on that. Yep. And I think like, some of the early arguments that Coin Center made was around leveraged Bitcoin's transparency to, you know, embellish its position in front of law enforcement. But it feels as if in 2019 that that plank, because of the technology developments, that plank is going to get weaker for Coin Center, and therefore there has to be a different thrust, a different way of arguing for uh, for the development of these technologies. But I, um, I think that's right. Um, I think that's definitely what happened. Uh, uh, but I also think that those positions are completely consistent. So in 2015, when a member of Congress would come and ask us and say, hey, is Bitcoin anonymous or can police um, catch bad guys? The correct answer is no, it's not anonymous. And let me explain to you how indeed uh, law enforcement has used the blockchain um, uh, with forensic analysis to catch bad guys. And that satisfies a member of Congress. Of course, you know, in the back of my mind, I might think, I might speculate, you know, but I can also s imagine that in the future, it's not always going to be anonymous. Um, and so we always knew that at some point we would have to address that. And so that time has finally come. Um, uh, and so that's what we're doing. Very interesting. So I think we have never covered this topic with Peter, so it will be nice to start with you. Tell us about this paper, um, which is the case for electronic cash. What's the main thrust and the argument of this, of this paper? Sure. So the paper is actually um, not completely about cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency kind of comes in at the very end. Um, and the paper um, is actually just a case. Take away electronic. It's really just a case for cash. Because I was telling you before, when I write a paper, I usually try to imagine uh, a reader that I'm writing for. And in this case, my reader um, was a mid-level official at a law enforcement agency or at a regulatory agency. Somebody who um, maybe instinctively um, thinks cash is something that maybe could be eliminated um, or that is problematic uh, because they're always dealing with bad guys. And you have to say, no, actually, cash is essential to a liberal uh, open society, which is which the preservation of which is the reason that many folks in government who are true patriots, um, go into government service and law enforcement service uh, to protect, right? They want to preserve an open liberal society. They care about the values this country was founded upon. Um, and, they, and that's what they're dedicating their lives to uh, preserving. And I need to explain to them that cash is um, an essential component of that. 
And so that's what the paper tries to do. And, and the argument is pretty straightforward. And I think it's one that um, uh, I think is pretty intuitive to cryptocurrency enthusiasts, but I think uh, regular folks, folks in government probably don't think about it. And it's this. Uh, we are moving to an increasingly um, cashless society. And I describe how um, uh, we're seeing more and more transactions moving um, to uh, uh, basically credit cards or mobile payment systems. And you can look at certain countries, Nordic countries, for example, Korea, um, where cash at this point is really a relic, right? It's something that uh, is very rare. Um, ATMs are rare. Bank branches don't carry cash. And everywhere you go, you basically um, pay with a credit card and they'll look at you weird if you pay uh, with cash. Um, and what I point out is in that world, that a cashless society is an intermediated society. Because if you remove cash as an option, that means every single transaction that you do is going to be intermediated by some bank or some uh, uh, corporation, some payment provider. And what that means is, is that every transaction is going to be A, surveilled, so it's going to be seen by a third party, and B, um, the transaction um, can be blocked, or you know, uh, either selectively, or you can be blocked completely from the ability to uh, transact. When you have that, um, that is a real challenge to a liberal open society. Where, and then so then I, I basically give some uh, examples of how, for example, in China, uh, this is being used. And China is really a remarkable uh, case study because uh, in the span of really just a few years, um, cash has been almost eliminated. People have just moved completely to using uh, uh, Alipay and WeChat Pay. And, um, and those two um, uh, account for I think like 90% of all mobile payments in, uh, in China. And so what you have there is a, is a world where all transactions are visible by these two companies, which are basically means that they're visible to uh, the state. Um, and they will block you uh, if you're trying to, to do things you're not, you know, that, in the words of what an executive from Alipay, uh, um, are not healthy. Um, the other thing that they'll do is that they, you know, it, this feeds into the Chinese social credit uh, scoring system, and this means that you know what you buy and what you uh, do is going to feed into um, uh, your your social credit score um, that then uh, uh, will go into what schools you can send your kids to, uh, what flights you can take, um, et cetera. So really, this is kind of uh, having an intermediated society um, really opens up a door for a more authoritarian um, uh, control of one's life. That's the state control. You also have corporate um, uh, potential um, misuse. And the example I give is uh, Target. Um, there was a, a, a case study that, that I highlight where there was a, um, this happened, uh, I think like five years ago, there was a, um, a, a father of a teenage girl who walked into a, a Target, this is in the New York Times, um, uh, related this, uh, walked into the store and basically chewed out the manager. So, you know, he had a, a, a mailer in his hand uh, that was for baby products, right? And said, what are you trying to do? This was sent to my house. Uh, addressed to my daughter, and uh, she is, you know, 16 years old. What are you trying to do? Get her, you know, you want her, you think she, she should be pregnant? What, what is this, right? The manager looked at it. He didn't know what it was. He apologized. He says, I don't know. Father went away. A couple of days later, the manager called the father um, and said, hey, I'm just calling to apologize again. And the father said, no, actually, I owe you an apology. Um, it turns out there's been some activity in my house that I didn't know about, and my daughter's due. Uh, in a couple months. Um, how did Target know that that girl was pregnant? They know because every time you um, buy something at Target, Target is tracking you and com and, and uh, making a, uh, a dossier on you. Um, and so what they would do um, is when you use, you don't even have to opt into this, by the way. This is completely not 
you don't have there, there's no opt into this. Uh, whenever you shop at Target, you are assigned a customer number, unbeknownst to you. Um, and this is tied to, for example, whatever credit card you use that is associated with you. And they keep a list of everything uh, that you buy. And so what Target did is that they um, they had a uh, program for expecting mothers where they give them discounts and stuff. And so they knew that this cohort of people who had opted in um, were pregnant. They then basically just correlated the purchasing um, uh, activity of those people who they knew were pregnant with their wider just universe of customers and um, just using data uh, uh, mining, they could figure out quite specifically who was pregnant and even when they were probably due, right? Based on just the shopping habits, what you were buying. It's not that you're buying diapers. It could just be that you're buying, you know, uh, aloe vera lotion and chocolate, right? That that might be uh, a trigger. Um, and so this girl was uh, deprived of her privacy and she was deprived of her autonomy, right? She was deprived of her ability to tell her father about her pregnancy on her own terms. And she didn't opt into anything. So what is the only option that you have if you don't want to participate in that? It's cash, right? She could have paid in cash. So as we move to an increasingly um, cashless world, we need to preserve a form of cash. And that's, as we all know, that's cryptocurrency, right? That's cash that is, you know, to me, cash is, does not just mean money. Cash means a very specific kind of money. It's money that is person to person. It's bearer. Uh, it is censorship resistant, um, permissionless, and it is private. And so uh, that's important. I mean, cash Cash is one option. Another option is like having companies that don't like exploit data. And especially for something as sensitive and touchy as like a possible pregnancy. Like, I mean, that just feels totally unethical. Uh, and I mean, if you, from the European perspective, just seems like completely absurd that this would not actually uh, uh, you know, happen. Um, there, there's something quite, kind of paradoxical though, but when you're talking about the, the, the idea that money, you know, that sort of uh, a, a cashless society tends more towards uh, surveillance and payments potentially being blocked. And of course, like you know, this is rampant in China. I, I saw a video recently. I don't know if this was real or not. I always sort of question these videos, but there was a video of someone seemingly in China paying just with like a face ID. So with no phone, oh, yeah. like looking at a camera and, and someone like there's some sort of facial recognition and their account is being uh, debited. I don't know if this is true or if it's not, I'm sure it's coming soon. Uh, but uh, the, the, this, this idea obviously makes sense to us. But if you're addressing your paper to a, a law enforcement officer or a lawmaker, it seems like these are things that they, I mean, from, from my perspective, these are things that they would probably want, right? Like a law enforcement uh, professional say, hey, yeah, it's great that I can track, uh, you know, the bad guys and a lawmaker, of course, yeah, we want to block uh, people that are not, I don't know, like paying their taxes or, you know, it seems like these are tools that, you know, give, given the regulatory landscape and sort of FinCEN and all the AML and KYC and et cetera, like it seems that those directives go in the sense. No, of I, I don't think so, actually. Yes, I think that's their initial instinct, right? Um, is to say, we do want to be able to track. We do want to be able to block. I want to be able to do my job well and more efficiently. And so that's their initial instinct. And so, but what this paper tries to do is to point out to them what, you know, if we eliminated cash, so that your job could be very easy and you got all the tax sheets, what are you giving up? And when you point that out to them, people who work at FinCEN, people who work in law enforcement, they're, again, as I say, the reason they're in those jobs is because they're patriots who care about um, this country and the values that this country was founded on. And if you point out to them, um, do you want to be more like China? Or do you want to be more like what the U.S. is meant to be? They get it. They don't want to be like China, right? Um, they want to be able to uh, surveil people with a court order, right? They understand that with a court order is important, right? They, they're, they would, they're not uh, for getting rid of court orders, right? So I think that's what you have to point out to them. And so, look, I point out to them, you know, in the paper, there's another uh, sort of case study that, that I point out that I think for a policymaker, 
they should understand. So I, I, I explain what's happening in New York with the National Rifle Association, right? So the NRA, uh, whatever you think about the NRA, whatever you may think about uh, gun ownership or whatever, the NRA is a, what is it? It is a free association of people. It's a nonprofit. So it's a free association of people that engages in what? It engages in free speech. All the NRA does is publish, right? Publish papers, they lobby Congress, right? So they're engaging in, in constitutionally protected activity to do what? To uh, stand up for another uh, uh, enumerated constitutional right, which is the right to, to bear arms. So what they're doing is basically just a nonprofit engaging in free speech. That's the NRA, um, whether, whether you like him or not. The governor of New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo, um, after a school shooting, he put out a press release where he announced that he was directing the Department of Financial Services in New York, DFS, to basically tell all financial institutions that do business in New York, which means all financial institutions in the world, right, to essentially stop doing business with the NRA, right, or their um, basically their licensing would be in jeopardy. If you cannot get a financial institution that does business with New York to service you, you're dead. You're out of business completely, right? So what is this? This is governor of New York using his power um, to basically silence and shut down a political opponent because he doesn't like their political views, not because they're doing anything wrong, it's just shut them down completely. And so today, that's Andrew Cuomo and the NRA. Tomorrow, um, it could be Alabama and Planned Parenthood, right? We don't want that in this country. These and I are think, very U.S. centric views, I must say. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> because I mean, like, I mean, yeah. from from this side of the pond, it just seems, of course, of course, you'd want to stop the NRA. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I I understand from like yeah, but uh, it, U.S. perspective, like under under the under the you know the Constitution and free speech. That yes, this does seem absurd. Yeah, and and you're right. So so we're definitely making uh, uh, U.S. centric arguments uh, here, right? The, these arguments may not be uh, uh, very persuasive to people in China, maybe not to people in France either. Um, uh, but yeah, so what is the NRA engaging in? It's engaging in free speech. You know, like four or five years back, I would have had difficulty empathizing with this argument. But I empathize with this argument ever since I've like founded a cryptocurrency company and have had to search for bank accounts in the US. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, it's like a huge challenge. Yeah. And even after you get a bank account, every three months, there'll be a, an email from your banker asking you a bunch of questions. And you'll wonder, oh, am I going to be shut down now? <laughs> You're paying all the taxes. You have all of all of your legal documents in order. You have lawyers in your team, everything. But still, it's a constant worry that one of these few banks that are willing to give a bank account is going to shut shut it down. And then we can be completely ostracized from the American financial system. Like this, this is a possibility we uh, we live through as a law-abiding member of the U.S. society. I I live through this possibility. Mm -hmm. And then you realize, well, if I'm living through it, maybe there have been other people that were are also living through like situations like these. Right. And and then then you realize that like, oh, the cryptocurrency is actually a tool for freedom because like there are people like me, they might be doing other things, not doing cryptocurrency, but they have this risk and this tool set serves to alleviate that risk. I think that's right. Um, and look, you understand from, from that position, if you don't have a bank account, you can't do business. And you're not doing anything wrong. You're doing everything by the book, as you say. Um, and because you're perceived as a risk, you're just shut out. Like you, Basically, you can't engage in business. We can then qu query whether you should be seen as a risk or not. But put that aside. In the case of, you know, the, the case with New York, the reason the NRA is being targeted is for their political views. Period. Like there's no there's no risk. There's not, they're not doing anything except publishing books and videos. And the governor is deciding to single them out unilaterally and say, "We're gonna just turn you off." 
right? And so pointing that out to folks um, who otherwise might say, yeah, this is a great tool uh, for law and order is to be able to track and shut down people when you point out to them, yeah, but then somebody could just use that and for a political purpose, you know, they might begin to understand. And look, we don't say, I don't think that cryptocurrency, for it to be a, a tool for freedom, as you say, people have to switch completely to cryptocurrency. It just has to be an option. It has to be an escape valve, right? So that if you're engaging in activity that might be politically incorrect and somebody wants to shut you down or you don't want to be uh, observed, you're this girl, you don't want to, in a cashless society where we no longer have paper notes, um, you need to have that option, right? The people need to retain that option uh, uh, to transact privately and to transact in a censorship resistant fashion. Yes, this this I absolutely agree with, um, <laughs> and, uh, and wholeheartedly. I mean, think that like, of course, we need to have that option, and there are still strongholds like, you know, like Germany, for instance, is 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 a place where, yeah. I, 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 although it frustrates the hell out of me every time yep. I go there, uh, I have to remember to take out a bunch of cash before I go there, uh, and, and I'm there quite often. I, I still forget to do it, but yeah, it, it, it is, uh, after a while, it, it does feel sort of satisfi satisfying to be able to say, hey, like, I, I, like, people here sort of hold this, this very dearly, like, they, they hold this, this right to pay with cash very dearly, and it is disappearing because, yeah. you know, even the it's European just Union is, too much. yeah. Are, are passing directives to you know try to make card payments easier cheaper faster and at some point you know like even here in france like it's illegal to pay for anything in cash for more than a thousand euros i think so we do see this clamp down on cash sort of oh totally uh it's germany is very interesting uh because as you say it's it's sort of the opposite it's a country that until a couple of years ago you could not pay in anything except cash at aldi or ikea they did not accept anything except cash, which is just amazing, right? Uh, so I don't have to tell you this, right? Many places in, in Germany are, are cash only. What's interesting about that is is why is that? And I, you know, I I don't know. I you know, we should ask some of our German friends. Uh, but my intuition is that it has to do with Germany's experience with two kinds of authoritarian regimes, right? They they uh, Germany was subjected to both communism and uh, Nazism. Uh, and they're very uh, sensitive to the kind of control um, that you can experience that way. And, you know, they, they're trying to always retain uh, that option. It's interesting you, you point out that in France you can't pay in cash for certain things above. Uh, something that I discovered in my research for this paper is that uh, the reason you had a 500 euro note, um, which is something that so many members of the uh, of the European Union are trying to get rid of is because Germany insisted on it. Uh, and Germany would have had a thousand euro note, uh, but we're talked down to just having a 500 uh, euro note. And that I think it, it is ultimately going to get uh, phased out. Yeah, of course. And the five euro, 500 euro note is in fact used quite a bit for organized crime. So I think it probably will get phased out just for because of sheer like numbers, right? Like nobody uses a 500 euro note. I, I've never even seen one, so. <laughs> this episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft had you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at msftblockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure 
for their support of Epicenter. So moving on to our next topic uh, today, which is Libra. Of course, Libra was announced a couple of weeks ago, about mid-June, and it's generated a whole lot of buzz and acclaim and anger and <laughs> a whole lot of things, uh, a whole lot of opinions uh, from a whole lot of different angles and perspectives. Um, I'd like to yeah, ask you, what are your thoughts on Libra at a high level? At a high level, it's, it's just very interesting what they're doing. Uh, I think bottom line, it's a net positive uh, for cryptocurrency if it launches and uh, it gets adoption uh, where people begin to get used to having a mobile wallet um, that where they have uh, a token that is not denominated in their uh, country's currency, right? If they get used to that, um, you can imagine that that uh, uh, opens up the idea space for other cryptocurrencies. And so that's all a net plus. On the flip side, I'm a little concerned um, on the regulatory front or on the on the policy front that uh, you know, cryptocurrency has been sort of a minor policy issue um, in DC, uh, and again, very US centric. But I can imagine this is the same in capitals all around. You know, cryptocurrency is an issue that policymakers um, pay attention to, but it's not the top issue, um, and uh, uh, there isn't any major player that is sort of like the base of crypto. You have Lots of different folks building lots of different things. Um, and so you have this vibrant ecosystem. When you have Facebook coming in with uh, a project like this, um, I think there is a uh, possibility that, number one, cryptocurrency all, all of a sudden gets a lot of attention from policymakers. Uh, and number two, Facebook becomes the base of cryptocurrency, even though what the project that they're building is... I, I would say not a cryptocurrency and completely unlike any of these other things. And so we've begun to see uh, folks um, who reach out to us a little confused about the distinction between something like Libra and Bitcoin or Ethereum. And so part of what we've been trying to do is explain these things are completely different. There are some similarities, but they're very different. And what's important is, is that those technical differences drive different policy outcomes. Explain then how, in your view, Libra is different from Bitcoin. And is Libra cash? Uh, no, uh, I would say um, Libra is not cash. Um, I'll tell you how it's different. Um, uh, number one, Bitcoin does not have a company that issues it and redeems it, right? Uh, Bitcoin emerge uh, from uh, a network of peers who join together and validate transactions for each other. So, so there's no company that controls or runs or issues the Bitcoins, right? Uh, Bitcoins do not have a reserve of quote unquote real world assets uh, that back the token and that are redeemable, right? That is what Libra is, right? So Libra has a company that runs it. It's called the Libra Association. Uh, uh, that company, um, issues the crypto, I wouldn't say crypto, issues the digital currency um, and manages a fund of assets uh, that back that thing. These are completely different things. One is a company issuing a token. Uh, the other is a network that is open, permissionless, and nobody owns or controls. Uh, and again, these uh, have what you would, you would think would have completely different regulatory regimes. Yeah. Whereas because in one case, there are no intermediaries and because there are no intermediaries, uh, it poses fewer risks. And because there are fewer risks, there's less regulation that's necessary. Uh, with the other, there is a major intermediary, the operator, the administrator of the uh, uh, network um, that also custodies and manages a fund of real world assets. And so that's a risk and that's where regulation might be appropriate. So, so you're saying then that, that the, the, the Libra Association, which is this consortium of companies, you know, among which we see Uber, Facebook, you know, some Iliad, um, you know, a whole, whole bunch of others, uh, are, are, are essentially the administrators of this cryptocurrency. 
because they issue the currency. So based on this this basket of currencies and real world assets, the 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 currency, the Libra currency will get its value. And then presumably there will be issuance and sort of, I don't know if you want to call it quantitative easing on the other side, but like <laughs> some, uh, uh, whatever, like the, the, the uh, destruction of the currency in order to uh, assure uh, like a stable price. At which point do you think, because the paper does say that they want to make it more decentralized, but you know, should that logic then become, I don't know, like a smart contract, you know, like, or governed by a smart contract that is administered by the Libra blockchain and the admin, the, the different companies part of the consortium are merely validators. So, you know, something akin to Cosmos, uh, at, at which point do this, this, this association cease to become an administrator and just, you know, another, another cryptocurrency that just happens to have a mechanism that adjusts based on, you know, oracles that fetch the sort of price of other other assets i think the the main sticking point for so you know as you know uh the libra association and its um documentation they make a commitment to uh move towards a permissionless network within five years i think that's fantastic i really struggle to see how that's going to be possible uh while maintaining everything else that they that is true about libra uh i think that there are technical challenges about how you do on-chain governance, uh, but I think those are probably solvable. I think that there are uh, in- incentive problems because you've got a couple dozen companies at the moment who have paid $10 million to be investors in Libra, and they are going to be paid back based on the interest of the reserve, right? In order for this to become permissionless, they're going to have to grow the number of validators to hundreds, thousands, infinity, right? Well, that means that they are going to just voluntarily give up their shares in the ownership and uh, dividends of the reserve. So query what incentive they have uh, to do that. But putting all that aside, assume that they just out of their goodness of their heart, they just want to give that up. The last thing that I think makes this um, kind of impossible is if you have a reserve of real world assets, those real world assets are going to be kept where? They're going to be kept at financial institutions. Financial institutions do not um, open and maintain bank accounts for DAOs, right? There has to be a person, a legal person's name, who owns the assets that backs the currency. That's going to always be a company run by people. Maybe those people want to um, always abide by the decisions of the DAO, of the network. Um, but what if they get a court order? So as long as, they're, as long as this is backed by real world funds kept in financial institutions, it's not going to be permissionless. I, I don't see how, let me put it, take it back. I don't see how you permissionless. One way you might see it is if you uh, can imagine completely permissionless central bank coins being issued, then you can imagine what, something like what they're doing. But we don't have that uh, yet. Q David Altofado on this one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's almost as if like to be permissionless to avoid the regulatory regimes. Yeah. You need to have assets that's untethered to any of the any of the fiat money systems like Bitcoin, like Zcash. If you if you tether it, it will reside in some financial institution. And then they can be court orders and they, they they'll always need to be like these people that are that have that bank account and that will always be this point of control. centralization, control, yep. trust in that system. And you can't get rid of it. I think that's right. And I think that that um, brings up basically two types of regulation. One is control in a sense of being told you can't, you know, you have to freeze these particular uh, address and these funds, or you have to block these transactions or you know, whatever, that, that kind of control. Um, but I think also, if you are um, managing, you don't have this in Bitcoin, right? In Libra, there is a company that has a fund of billions of dollars, potentially, right? Hundreds of billions of dollars, if this is very successful, of whose money? The public's money. And they're managing it for the benefit of the public and to keep a promise that they're going to manage it to have a stable value. That's a big responsibility that they're taking on. And I think most governments would see that as 
an activity that probably would be regulated. And then the interesting question is, well, how, who's the right regulator? What's right regulation? What's, what is Libra? I think is a, is a very interesting question. What's the US centric answer to, to who regulates Libra in the US? Yeah, it's not clear. So you might think, you know, is it a bank? Um, it looks like a shadow bank, right? In, in some sense. Uh, uh, it's not a bank because it doesn't have a bank charter, right? Um, is it a money transmitter? Um, uh, or in, in the European uh, uh, sense, is it an e-money company? Um, I'm not sure it can be because um, state money transmission. So number one, it would mean that the Libra Association would have to go state by state and get money transmission licenses, which is, it is not doing. Calibra, the subsidiary of Facebook, is. Um, Libra Association um, is not. Um, uh, but if they did, money transmitters are only permitted to keep the their customer funds in very um, specific, specified uh, permissible investments, right? This is a problem that Coinbase had in uh, uh, Wyoming and Washington State and Hawaii where Bitcoin was not one of the permissible investments listed. And so they would have to hold like a 200% reserve requirement. So they just got out of those states. So these are very, very limited things that you can keep the money in. As far as I understand, foreign currency and foreign issued government debt is not one of the things that's permitted. So I'm not sure how they could be a money transfer. So what are they? I mean, it, the thing that just jumps out to me is if you take away all of the blockchain and crypto and tech lingo from what they're doing and you just look at the activity, what is the activity that they're doing? Well, what are they doing? They're taking money from the public and they are investing it in a fund of foreign currencies and government debt so that everybody has a share of that, basically, and they're actively managing this fund to maintain its value. What is that? I mean, it sounds to me like a mutual fund. So that's a security, right? And if you look at the definition of security in, in the Securities Act, uh, it's, you know, there are a lot of broad, there's like debt instruments, um, just plainly are securities. So this is, a, so, you know, it could be that this is a security. And if it's a security, how does it work as a currency? Because securities can only be traded on national security exchanges. So anyhow, it just there's a lot of questions there that uh, uh, to be sorted out through. Well, you heard it here, folks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Libra is a security. No, I, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying I don't understand. I, I want to. Uh, uh, I'm saying. Tell me why why I'm wrong. Uh, no, that's what what, that's missing. really interesting. I don't. I mean, the, the most interesting part of that is in how do you use a security as money, and and I think that's a question that lawmakers will struggle with for, for and, and Libra probably will struggle with for a while. Though, there was one point that I wanted to bring up, which is uh, which which is interesting, and you sort of touched on it, and and that's how Calibra is going actually out and getting all these money yeah. transmitter uh, licenses, but but the association is not. And uh, you tweeted in response to uh, a, an interview on the Unchained podcast with Laura Shen where she interviewed um, uh, Dante Desparte, who's the head of policy at Libra. And she asked him, okay, well, then, then you know, Libra, if Libra is regulated and they have to abide by, um, by uh, OFAC uh, sanctions lists, mm -hmm. then there's the whole question of, okay, well, what if the U.S., for instance, wants to sanction Iran and, you know, Europe yeah. doesn't? Yep. And, and his answer was, well, you know, that's not up to the, uh, that's not up to um, the, the association. That's really up to, the companies that are operating as money services businesses, so for instance, Calibra and, and presumably others that are you know, operating wallets and and, and and applications like user applications, but they have, the, the 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 association isn't concerned with this sort of thing. And you argued that he was probably wrong about that. Uh, could you break that down for us? Sure. I, and, and look, I mean, I, I hate to be this guy, but I'm, I'm, uh, it's not so much that I'm arguing against it. I'm just asking questions, as they say, because I don't understand how it could be otherwise. So look, um, you've got the Libra Association. The Libra Association is, uh, again, the company that is issuing the, the coins and redeeming them. Um, under FinCEN's guidance, a, co a company that issues and redeems digital currency is a money transmitter. Uh, is an administrator of a centralized virtual currency um, and so would be subject to uh, a BSA, Bank Secrecy Act regulation, right? So I, I don't see how they escape that. 
if you look at, um, I, I think what Libra, what the Libra Association is saying is that the on ramps and the off ramps to uh, uh, to Libra will be regulated, and that's absolutely true. This is the same thing uh, as Bitcoin, right? So, uh, Bitcoin the network is not regulated, but Coinbase or Bitfinex or whoever it may be, these are regulated and they do have to know their customers and they do have to do uh, uh, suspicious activity reports and arrest. And so Libra is right when they say that the on-ramps and the off-ramps, the exchanges that trade in Libra will be regulated. But they sort of, it, it, the question is, what about the Libra association, right? And so with Facebook, or sorry, with, uh, with Bitcoin, OFAC, um, a few months ago, added a few Bitcoin addresses to the sanctions list, right? Just the addresses themselves. And so this means that regulated parties have an obligation. In fact, not just regulated parties, everybody in the world has an obligation, or everybody in the U.S. anyway, all U.S. persons have uh, an obligation to not do business with those addresses. And if they happen to do uh, by mistake, they need to report it immediately, right? So that's the kind of thing that Coinbase and uh, Bitfinex and, and the rest will block transactions with those addresses. But there is no company, there is no Bitcoin company that can do that at the network master level, right? With Libra, there is. And so I don't see how they escape a court order or, uh, or, or just um, uh, having to comply with OVAC and block uh, sanctioned uh, addresses. Does that make sense? Yeah, that that really makes a lot of sense, actually. <laughs> and um, because they have the ability, right? A yeah. As as the validators, um, they could push a software update uh, that blocks particular um, addresses that they've been told to. And then they would have the obligation to. Uh, yeah, if they have the ability, then they have the obligation. With Bitcoin, there's no ability, right? So that's why there's no obligation. Right. Uh, and so very quickly, again, on this topic of Libra, the, before we move on to FinCEN, we're conscious of your time here. So there's been a lot of pushback by by regulators and lawmakers in the U.S. and in Europe. Yeah. And particularly in the U.S., there is this um, uh, this uh, Committee on Financial Services who wrote a, a letter to um, Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sanders and uh, uh, David Marcus asking them to stop all development of Libra. Uh, what does this letter mean, in your opinion? I think this letter means that politicians, members of Congress from both parties, um, really, really don't like Facebook. Um, and you know, uh, the different uh, parties have different reasons um, to be upset with Facebook, but that's just a, a, a political fact um, that uh, members of Congress from both parties uh, just you know, do not trust Facebook, uh, do not like Facebook. And so when they uh, are confronted with this announcement of we're going to build a new global currency, uh, you know, I, I think that they are, you know, kind of scoring political points a little bit. Um, but I think also, um, uh, you know, expressing th their distrust of Facebook. A member of Congress can send you a letter and ask you to stop doing something that carries no weight. Uh, obviously, and I think it is actually um, a little bit uh, uh, un-American to use a, a, a phrase that without any legal process, you'd be told to stop until Congress can think about what you're doing. That's not the way things work here. Um, that said, I think it kind of highlights um, the political reality that Facebook uh, faces. Very interesting. I think like I think the Libra experiment is going to. I teach all of us so much about how these systems are, are going to work. And I suspect maybe the conclusion in the end might well be, well, that's why Bitcoin is designed the way it is. <laughs> I think you might be right. Yeah. So um, moving on to uh, the, the FinCEN. So, so FinCEN recently, the FinCEN, which is the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, they recently issued some guidance on how the Bank Secrecy Act applies to cryptocurrencies and its users. So we'd like to unpack uh, this guidance. But before we unpack this guidance, perhaps it's nice to know about like what is FinCEN, what is its role, and what does it regulate? Sure. So in the U.S., you have the Bank Secrecy Act. 
the Bank Secrecy Act is a uh, financial surveillance uh, statute. It requires financial institutions to know their customers, uh, to register uh, with FinCEN, um, and to uh, provide information such as the suspicious activity reports to FinCEN. And so FinCEN is the um, uh, regulatory agency within Treasury that basically manages the Bank Secrecy Act, right? Uh, and so it makes sure that all financial institutions are doing KYC, reporting to them, et cetera. And so when you have cryptocurrency, the question is, um, what obligations uh, and, to, and to which actors in the cryptocurrency space um, does the Bank Secrecy Act apply, right? Who has what obligations? Um, and FinCEN in 2013 was the first federal agency to uh, come out with any sort of official pronouncement on cryptocurrency, on Bitcoin uh, at the time. What it said is basically the network itself has no obligations because there's nobody running it, right? But on-ramps and off-ramps, exchangers of cryptocurrency um, have are basically our financial institutions. They're money transmitters, and so therefore they're financial institutions that are regulated. Um, it basically had three categories of people, right? It said there were users of cryptocurrency, and users of cryptocurrency have no obligations. There are exchangers of cryptocurrency, and they have regulations. And then it has a third category, which does not apply to Bitcoin, but only applies at the time to things like eGold and Liberty Reserve, called administrators. And administrators are those who administer a centralized virtual currency and put into circulation and redeem from circulation. Uh, digital currency, and they are also uh, BSA regulated. So they put this guidance out in 2013, and it's um, a pretty, uh, I think, fair settlement um, for who has what obligations in crypto. But there were all kinds of questions that once you start applying that to what people are doing in the real world, they're kind of open questions that uh, remain, right? So is a DEX a, um, a money transmitter, et cetera? Um, and what they did just a few months ago with their new guidance is nothing changed, right, from the from the existing guidance. They just restated the guidance as it was in 2013, but answered a lot of the questions that have sort of been uh, bubbling up since 2013. And the way they did that is by taking the original guidance and applying it to uh, fact patterns from business models. Um, that have emerged and say, okay, well, how does it apply to this? How does it apply to this? And uh, we were very happy to see that um, the approach that they took matches what Coin Center has been advocating for since 2013. So what have you guys been advocating and what are some of the major uh, points in this guidance? So the, 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 the big headline takeaway is that if you are simply building software, writing software um, and deploying software, uh, you are not regulated, right? Um, it is if only if you're engaging in money transmission uh, that you're regulated. And money transmission means uh, receiving um, and sending. Uh, and that making that super clear, I think, is, is the big uh, takeaway. Um, there's still some ambiguities that kind of remain because, so imagine that you build a DEX. Building and deploying the DEX um, may not be uh, money transmission, but then if you use it, that might be money transmission. So, uh, so that's interesting. Um, but look, I, I think it's a, again a pretty fair settlement of of where uh, uh, we've gotten to things. And I would encourage our listeners to uh, to go to Coin Center's article uh, detailing the contents of this guidance. We'll link to that in the show notes and a whole bunch of other content that uh, Jerry and Coin Center have written. Uh, including uh, Jerry's tweet storms uh, about Libra, uh, which are always great to read. Uh, Jerry, thanks very much for joining us today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.